Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Aaron Dykes. Today is Wednesday, June 27, 2012. Tonight, shocking images have emerged which show the aftermath of Christian churches ransacked by NATO-backed Syrian rebels, illustrating once again how Western powers are supporting Muslim extremists in their bid to achieve regime change in the Middle East. Meanwhile, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice calls for arming the Syrian opposition. You know, the one already armed and trained by the CIA and MI6. I do believe that you're probably ultimately going to have to arm the opposition, maybe even today, because uh, people are being armed. Uh, Assad is being armed by the Russians and uh, by the Iranians. Then, a massive cyber attack is in progress in the United States, Europe and Latin America. And five of the biggest banks in the U.S. are putting the finishing touches on plans for going out of business. All that and more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. And then coming up later in the broadcast, I'm, I'm going to speak to Washington Blog's Carl Herman about why all the state budget and pension crisis may not be all it's cracked up to be. Yes, it's about the elephant in the room, the CAFR. That's coming up later, so stay tuned. Also, we're going to have another segment of Ask Alex, a Planet InfoWars special. That's over 25 minutes long as well, so plenty in the broadcast. But first, our top stories, we turn to Cyber False Flag. It's a fraud ring in a hack attack on more than 60 banks, we're told. So far, they've stolen 60 million euros, but it could be a total sum of more than $2 billion or even $2.5 billion. And what's more, the security experts at McAfee and Guardian Analytics are saying it required an insider level of understanding. Is this an inside job? That is the question as we look at how they use automated systems to hack into banks in Europe and Britain and in North America and across Latin America. The questions are, can this spread? How did they get inside the banks and loot this money, siphoning it off from large accounts? Accounts, then moving it to their mule accounts. Well, this article out of Sky News admits in the last two paragraphs that the details of this global fraud came just one day after the MI5 boss warned of the new cybersecurity threat to UK businesses. Yes, this is a cybersecurity issue. We've been warning about it for months and years now. Cybersecurity inside the US is only two years old. General Keith Alexander, head of the NSA, was just moved into his general title as he became not only the head of the NSA, but the head of cybersecurity. And you know they've been meeting that about this issue at Bilderberg and others. So let's go more deeply into the ongoing cyber attack to see if there's a reason why they're saying it's an inside job or that they're warning about cybersecurity, trying to get a mandate for the issue. Massive cyber attack in progress in the U.S., Europe, and Latin America. That's Max Slavo of the SHTFplan.com, uh, who goes on about the $2.5 billion that could be missing. And it says, unlike the standard spy eye and Zeus attacks that typically feature live manual interventions, they've got dozens of groups using server-side components and heavy automation with no human participation required. It moves quickly and scales neatly. It combines an insider level of understanding. Again, there it is, the insider level of understanding. And so then it goes on more deeply into the article to assess Silver Doctor's analysis that our thoughts is this is either an arrangement Iranian Stuxnet retaliation, Stuxnet of course created by the West, a joint partnership between the U.S. and Israel, or it's a false flag banking system lockup by the central Western banks themselves 
who are using it to conveniently pin the blame for an imminent derivatives-induced contagion and banking collapse. So in other words, instead of investigating all these big banks themselves for their role in fraud, let's have a little bit of low-level fraud, then slap more restraints on the average user, more controls over their capital, because you've already heard about how cash is being gradually phased in is more and more illegal in parts of Europe. It's starting to hit home in the U.S. And they want these capital controls when they have bank holidays or when they shut down ATMs and you can't get access. Well, that's already been going on at the Royal Bank of Scotland and other parts of the U.K. ahead of this new cybersecurity threat that, again, was warned about by this MI5 boss, the new cybersecurity threat. There it is. And so Max Slava writes, governments have needed a pretext to tighten bank regulations and gain even more authority over the individual movement of capital. Whether real or false flag, this cyber attack may very well give them the ammunition they need to take complete control of the internet. Again, we reported ahead of the Bilderberg meeting the plans for an internet ID mandatory in Europe from members of the European Parliament and again about the ongoing cyber security agenda that they've met for the past five years at Bilderberg to discuss. Meanwhile, the U.S. Army admits its own troops conducting law enforcement on the streets of America is illegal. We've covered this yesterday. Paul Joseph Watson has a follow-up article today. So it's not only people on the streets saying this would be a great thing and they can't wait to salute the troops as they come by and how the scary aspect may help cut down on crime. But there you have it in plain sight at the end of this news report where Captain William Geddes of the U.S. Army Reserve says in no uncertain terms it's actually against federal law for them to do police patrols. Of course it is. It's posse commentatus, but you've got all these globalists, uh, they cite here in Paul Joseph Watson's article, the Council on Foreign Relations figure, who have been working for years to legitimize the transition from military into police patrol aspects. It says right here, transition into a more flexible force. And so they're phasing this in. And you can see it's also interesting in the report how the reporter himself is clearly calling for people who approve of the troops being on the streets. He suggests to one of the respondents that, oh, this might help cut down on crime. Well, that's the association they want, that the scary troops in the street will help you by cutting down on crime. And what are they saluting? It's a takeover from the global system, from the NATO and, uh, excuse me, from the NATO, EU, and World Bank systems occupying America. That's what these troops on the street represent, but they want you to ask for the troops. We saw this kind of propaganda a couple of years ago in Detroit. I don't know if we have it pulled up, but we actually got a shot of them begging for 20,000 troops. There it is. Where's 20,000 troops to protect our children and communities? So they've taken one of these boarded up buildings. Who knows who put it, up, put it there, but it's an apparent cry from the community itself for troops on the streets to protect us. Well, that's what they want us to accept as the economic crisis continues, widens, and gets worsened, is to be used to the idea that the troops are there to save us. It's part of a larger issue, but it's also strange that these troops are once again coming out of Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri, the same place where the concentration camps have been reported, the same place where they've had them training for the MP duties and the occupation of these internment camps. It all just kind of adds together after a while, but we're just supposed to get used to it and accept it. Now, turning to the larger economic crisis, the coming crash, SG, SGT has the report, watching the clock. Will a total economic collapse occur in September or October? Obviously, no man knows the hour unless, of course, of course, it's contrived. But what you do when you analyze things and try to track trends is you want that overlay effect where you have one report matching with another. That's when it becomes significant. That's when it becomes a likely trend. That's when there's something going on behind the scenes. And so they put together all these different warnings and show how the timing adds up to right before the elections. Is it an October crisis or are they just unable to contain the economic crash from happening any sooner. Well, there's the warning, first of all, that was on Alex's show a couple days ago from the St. Louis officer, worried about how he's been told in October they need to be prepared for an event that will require them to use air and ground support in conjunction with the military. Very startling. That overlaid with the Silver Doctors report 
from the LEAP 2020 analysis for a red alert for the banking systems in September or October. That's when they say the trumpet blast will occur. Basically, the wall will come crashing down, and they won't be able to plug their little fingers in the dam any longer. In fact, it will spill over. That's according to their analysis. Then there's the third warning from Art Cashin of Zero Hedge, who talks about how the frequency with which the world goes to hell in September hardly seems random. And in fact, there's a chart to support this where you see at least 25 incidences in September where a banking crisis started, way more than all the other months. Something is going on there. That's also when you typically see the gold and silver runs as far as on the per annum basis month to month. Let's hope it doesn't happen, but it could be used for false flag control, October surprise, getting Obama reelected, or alternately giving a reason to give him the push and bring in Mitt Romney, the new savior, who will go for all these wars in the in the Middle East, who will go for all the austerity they want, and more. Meanwhile, in Europe, after Greece, Ireland, Portugal, and Spain have all asked for bailouts with more countries on the way, Cyprus has officially joined as the fifth member of the EU to seek a rescue. They want as much as $10 billion in euros, which is about $12.5 in dollars, because their banks are heavily exposed to Greece. Of course, Cyprus is kind of split between the pro-Greece faction and the extremely anti-Greece Turkish back faction. That will all just complicate things. But basically, you've got the head of the Cyprus Popular Bank being a former World Bank chairman, being a former part of this occupying system now asking for money to recapitalize the very banky heads. It's very strange. And then converse to that, they've got this communist president, Dimitris Christofias, the only communist leader in the EU, who's blasted the whole bailout system, calling it a colonial force. The European Central Bank, the European Commission, uh, the IMF all working to occupy these countries. And basically that is what's going on. But now he's going to have to turn inward and accept that kind of bailout as the only so-called solution. But the other thing to notice is Cyprus, just like Spain, has asked them not to do the austerity measures that's been such a big issue in Greece and Ireland and to a certain extent in Portugal. Another thing to keep an eye on, but the hammer is starting to fall in the U.S. too, as Stockton, California, is the latest city to file for bankruptcy. It's going to be the largest U.S. city to fall to date. It has almost 300,000 people in it. The nation's largest city to seek protection under the U.S. Bankruptcy Code after its city council Tuesday stopped bond payments, slashed employee health and retirement benefits, and adopted a day-to-day -day survival budget. And they had a meeting, and everyone in the town was sad about the bankruptcy they basically knew was coming for some time. The city made $90 million in drastic cuts from its general fund in the last three years, reducing the police department by 25%, fire department by 30%. This is, again, a city that has the second highest foreclosure rate in the whole country and one of the highest crime rates in all of California, and here it is. The thing is, it didn't have to go this way if you find out about CAFR, if we reallocate budgets in a sensible way, but the public doesn't know. That's why you need to stay tuned to the end of this interview. We're going to talk about California and their big pension dry up and their inability to fund these governments that are bloated, yes, but which have reserve capital no one knows about that is plenty to deal with the issue. That's with Carl Herman later in the broadcast. But finally, in the economic fold tonight, we have the big banks crafting living wills in case they fail. And Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan is telling us this will help the cost to taxpayers. This will allow banks to fail without it falling on the public. Well, we don't know if that's true, but they're saying these measures could be basically equivalent to reinstating Glass-Steagall, which they should probably do anyway. You've got Sheila Baer also backing the issue. And... On, on the surface, it is the system, the regulatory agencies of the government, forcing the big banks to basically set the architecture for decoupling, setting aside the normal day-to-day -day investments of people's accounts that should grow at a regular rate from the crazy speculation and the underwriting and all the other private equity stuff that really has caused all the derivatives problems triggering the larger economic collapse. It's, of course, very complicated. But they've got the biggest banks here, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, among others, being forced by the Federal Reserve and the FDIC to create these living wills 
for their liquidation, for the liquidation of the company. So we'll see. This is supposedly the solution under the Frank Dodd Act. Instead of repealing, I'm sorry, instead of restating the Glass-Steagall Act, this is their model for liquidating these banks and saving the public. We'll see if it works. Something tells me not to hold my breath. Anyway, we're going to turn now to a special whistleblower report from the 7-7 bombings. Uh, our reporter, Patrick Henningsen, got this exclusive interview. Very interesting topic. We'll go to that now, come back with more news, but stay tuned. It's a big program tonight. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. The terror event that changed the course of European domestic security policy. A devastating attack which hit underground trains and buses. It was both bold and brilliant in its execution. The official narrative is that of four radical British Muslims whose perfectly planned and run operation claimed the lives of some 52 innocent victims. In 2010, while compiling an annual strategic threat assessment, South Yorkshire Police's principal intelligence analyst Tony Farrell learned that the government narrative of Islamic extremists carrying out the attacks of both 9-11 and 7-7 was a lie, perpetrated by a mainstream media code of silence and complicit government officials, a stance which ultimately led to his dismissal. Infowars.com had a chance to speak with Mr. Farrell at a recent Employment Tribunal appeal hearing in London, where he sheds additional light on his pending case. My name's Tony Farrell. I um, work for South Yorkshire, or used to work for South Yorkshire Police as the principal intelligence analyst and worked for them for 17 years. And in um, September 2010, following a stance in July 2010 on the fifth anniversary of the London bombings, I made a stance that led to my dismissal. My stance was when tasked to do a, terror, uh, a strategic threat assessment, which incorporated, amongst other things, the threat from counter-terrorism. Um, in the light of uh, the realization that 9-11 and 7-7 were not as the government narratives would have us believe, I no longer was able to say that the threat was coming from Islamic extremism, as the government rhetoric was saying at that point, and my uh, managers in South Yorkshire Police wanted me to say. I felt that would be discriminatory against the Muslim communities in South Yorkshire and further afield. And I, I went to my boss, alerting them to the fact that there is all sorts of information um, available in open source, including the work that Alex Jones had done to expose this at the time. That was influential indeed. Um, and they uh, clamped down on me, uh, refused to contemplate the notion of uh, the threat being anything other than Islamic extremism, um, saying, you and I, Tony, are just the government foot soldiers. You'll never get the government to tell the truth. So they weren't saying you're wrong, Tony. They were just saying, go along with the lie and say that the threat's from Islamic terrorism. Um, they tried to get me down to occupational health. Now, for a day, I went along with it. But on the 8th of July, I went into work, and that was the day of the assignment. Uh, and the realization had only happened about a week or two before this. Uh, I'd given them a red alert. They ignored it. They were cornering me. Now, I felt as though now I either had to lie uh, and say that the threat was something that my analysis pointed towards was different. I couldn't lie in that situation, the professional standards for honesty, integrity, etc. So at that point, in, I, on the morning of the 8th of July, I made an absurd strategic threat assessment matrix as I was cornered into lying and I thrust a threat assessment matrix in front of the boss saying 9-11 truth, 7-7 truth and other aspects of criminality that South Yorkshire Police might be interested in I just put as irrelevant and scored it up. It was ludicrous but it was to reflect the absurdity of the situation that were putting me into and cornering me into lying and lying against the Muslim population in the United Kingdom where in the light of the government's contest strategy, the government counter-terrorism strategy, rich picture, 
the police forces in England and Wales and the communities were being encouraged to collect intelligence on Muslims, targeting mosques, targeting universities. Now, that's all well and good if there is a threat there, but in the light of 9-11 and 7-7 and other miscarriages of justice that I was alert to at that point, I thought, well, without proofs, I can't say that. That is really being discriminatory to my Muslim brothers and sisters. Um, and the threat almost certainly was coming from within, in, in whatever capacity. Now, I didn't know clearly how it had been perpetrated, which agents of the state, but what I did know for certain was that the government narrative, the 9-11 Commission report and the Home Office anonymous um, document, official document, was just a pack of lies. No other word for it. It was just ludicrous. So in the light of that, I made the stance, knowing full well that it's likely to end in tears. It's likely to end in dismissal. But my conscience said, take it, Tony, rather than prostitute yourself. So they uh, wanted to sort of treat it as if I was insane. So they tried to cart me off to occupational health. At first they resisted, but I did go to occupational health, came back with a clean bill of health. <laughs> I then went to a dismissal hearing in September, um, and I challenged them to do something about this. And, and let me give the strategic assessment fully to, to, to source everything up to say why I was more than justified in doing what I did. They didn't want to know and said, your beliefs may well be correct. You've had exemplary record for South Yorkshire Police, excellent work, but it's incompatible with where we are at the moment. So it was a very sad occasion. We're sacking you. By the way, you can appeal. I did appeal to the police authority who just rubber stamped the deal and said, Tony Farrell's views, this was a, a councillor, Tony Farrell's views are outlandish. Didn't it? Nobody investigated it. Outlandish. So then it went into an employment, a more formal footing, employment, a tri employment tribunal. I sought my legal advice and they said, best to argue on a discrimination on grounds of your religious philosophical beliefs, which is an unusual thing to do. Unfortunately for me, I, I, I went with it. Because I had said that, look, if you're asking me what a threat is, it's a satanic New World Order. But I would have never have said that had I not disbelieved 9-11 and 7-7. And he said, ah, that's religious philosophical to some degree. So I was steered down that route and uh, we had the pre-hearing in the tribunal to discuss whether that belief was a philosophical belief, because if it was, it would have been protected. But the judge, in a way correctly, diagnosed it as, well, look, that wasn't the cause of the blockage. He would have, it was the fact that 9-11, he, 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 he disbelieved 9-11, he disbelieved 7-7, based on empirical data, rather than the philosophical belief, right? So it was dismissed on those grounds. It left me an unfair dismissal. Could they have redeployed? Was it reasonable to sack me? And in September, three days in September 2011, in a hearing with Ian or Crane representing me as a lay representative, I'd run out of all resources to have legal representation. I lost an unfair, unfair dismissal hearing as well. Uh, now we have a course for appeal. We did appeal and the judge dismissed it with no reasonable prospects of success. But there is a rule in the Employment Appeal Tribunal, which we've taken advantage of to get us to court today. So sat ex parte, I, on my own, in front of the judge, South Yorkshire Police not present. The argument was really to say I was making, I, I, it wasn't a religious belief, it was a public interest disclosure act. It was a protected disclosure. I, as the intelligence analyst, had been tasked to do the analysis and they shouldn't have sat me just because they didn't like the analysis. I was speaking truth to power. Right? Not the truth that they wanted me to hear, the, uh, the enabling, they're enabling the one truth, but what I considered as the analyst being tasked to do the threat assessment as the truth to the best of my knowledge. So I put an inference on it. I didn't say it was dead certain. I said the inference being that it was almost certainly an inside job, 95% in the UK, 99% in America with the 9-11. The so I also said that the matrix system of threat assessment, and my first degree is statistics, was a, a ludicrous attempt by the government, National Police Improvement Agency, to almost mind control 
and dumbed down thinking, intel criminal intelligence analysis thinking, on looking at threat. Why would they do that? Well, the construct that they had within the matrix was artificial and deliberately heightened the fear coming from uh, Islamic extremism and a terror attack. So JTAC, Joint Terrorist Analysis Centre, always put out the threat levels as, as almost imminent, high or severe. Now, in a crude scoring system, that had to be transferred locally, irrespective of what intelligence you had locally. And, the, the, and the, potentially the harm a terrorist act could do, well, it's how far will the imagination stretch? You know, it could be anything. So the consequence, the harm, the probability, all meant that it meant that resources were being allocated to um, unaccountable resources within special branch and within MI5, right? But without the intelligence and the evidence to back it up. And in the light of 9-11-7-7, not squaring with the official accounts, I felt I had to make a stance on the strategic threat assessment said it was totally ludicrous. Uh, I'd always thought that anyway, but in the light of that, I thought enough no more, that's where I make the stance on the strategic threat. Now, that was why I was in the court today, arguing that a, it wasn't really a religious philosophical belief. We agree with that. There's no point of issue with the police. You know, there's no facts that we differ on, other than we are saying that as an analyst, I was making a protected disclosure. I was doing my job. I had a duty of care to present the truth. Now, they didn't have to accept the truth, but just because they didn't like the analysis on the threat, did they, was it reasonable for them to dismiss me? Now, if you're suppressing strategic analysis in that way, because an intelligence analysis is an evolving process whereby you give your intelligence and your intelligence officer office it may not agree with you but you start to converge to get to the truth and new information comes to light and hopefully you converge on that truth so in doing my job as an intelligence analyst i was sacked for telling what my analysis was now i stand by that analysis exactly now 18 months down the line nothing has come to light which remotely challenges the fact that i was right uh, you know that i heard in what i did so I'm pleased with what I've done. I had a duty of care. I followed through to it with my conscience. And sadly, I've ended up getting dismissed and on the verge of bankruptcy. But I'm, the reason why I'm doing this is not for compensation. It's that I believe it's in the public interest for this case to keep on going. Now, the judge today has dismissed it, right? Uh, the appeal, uh, Employment Appeal Tribunal saying, no, South Yorkshire Police had reasonable that that to behave, behave reasonably in dismissing me uh, and that as a point of law we can't really challenge that however he has left he's not slammed the door down not completely therefore there is a court of appeal so now it's getting into a, a quite high area now whereby under the public interest disclosure because i wasn't legally represented at the unfair hearing Right? We never cited the Public Interest Disclosure Act. Ian Crane, who represented me in September, wasn't a trained lawyer. But it, to all intents and purposes, he was arguing that I was making a protected disclosure. And I shouldn't be dismissed, especially when I'm the analyst assessing the threat. If, an, if anal analysis is the very product, strategic threat analysis, that should keep chief constables awake at night, and the fact that I was giving them unpalatable news, it was only doing my job. Why should you be sacked? Especially as there's, there's, there's no end of evidence that was presented today on 7-7 analysis and on all the people who've written widely on 9-11. It's not as if I'm a lone nut. There are serious, academic, weighty people now, are you bound to an oath when you take the job as, with the police? I sign an official secrets act. But the, the, are you bound to an oath to, to protect the public interest? Yeah, absolutely. Serve, yeah, yeah, yeah you're a public servant and you have a duty of care. Yeah. And it's the duty of care that are really, you know, compel me to speak truthfully on this matter. It wasn't a trivial issue that could be, we could sidestep round. I did, I did my job as the principal intelligence analyst and I have no regrets no matter what happens. And now it, we have, of course, as I say, to the, uh, the High Court, 
But what I need is, 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 is to expose this so that we, have, we can start to demonstrate equality of arms. In other words, it, time now, the public woke up to this because it's dangerous if we don't. And that if I can get that public support behind me, I mean, I've not got bad support in the truth movement, but it's not as high profile as it needs to be by the time I get to high court. But interestingly, the judge has left it open, so it's not inconceivable that the analysis that is available that completely discredits 9-11 and 7-7 could be actually tested in a court. And that's, what, that's all we can hope for. Whether we will ever get there is another matter. But I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm committed to keep on trying until I drop or win. And irrespective of the consequences. It's that important from a public interest perspective. And uh, I was fortunate enough to, ha to land on last week a very uh, interesting character, a QC Michael Shrimpton, who has appeared on the Alex Jones show in an interview. Uh, and is a uh, is secondary discipline besides being a barrister is a strategic intelligence analyst at the highest levels so he has contacts in america in the cia and in the british intelligence in mi5 mi6 but he is he himself is saying there is something radically wrong here now you need his his views don't exactly square with my views but he there's, there's enough commonality and his respect for the intelligence analysis function and his appreciation of it was ample for him to portray that importance of that function in front of a judge because in a way that's what he is an intelligence analyst so it's very helpful to have him come in at the 11th hour because i up until last week i was doing this myself and i would have stood no chance but at least there was a very strong healthy high quality debate on the legal side this morning public record and it's on the public record. So there you have it, Tony Farrell, a UK police analyst, intelligence analyst, blowing the whistle, but then being driven out of the agency. Of course, nothing really going on there, I'm sure. Uh, at any rate, we have the anniversary of the 7-7 bombings coming up in just a couple weeks here in, of course, July, and more reason than ever to shine a spotlight on that and all the false flags, 9-11, the Madrid bombing, the list is really pretty infinite, all having to do supposedly with Al-Qaeda. But then wait, we're backing Al-Qaeda in the Middle East. That's heating up once again. Not only did we put Al-Qaeda in as the Libyan rebels to topple Gaddafi, but now, of course, they are helping to topple Assad. That is heating up to the state of war. In fact, Assad himself has now declared Syria to be in a state of war, making it that much easier for the West to go full hot on what has been a covert war up to now, all part of the path to Persia and the possibility luring of Russia, China, and other entities into a wider World War III, or what you would call it. Let's hope it doesn't happen. But, of course, the Syrian rebels stormed the state media, killed seven people, and have effectively taken over that television station, important, of course, to the bolstering of Assad's regime, also iconic to the surge of the rebels. But again, the rebels are al-Qaeda-backed Western forces. Uh, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, and all the other United Nations entities have been backing the Syrian National Transition Council. Uh, Basma Kodmani was at the Bilderberg meeting this year, so it's very clear that the Transition Council is not only tied to al-Qaeda, but entirely Western-backed. They're just trying to get Assad out of the way so they can get that Western foothold in there. But it's complicated with our connections to Russia and China and the tangled web we weave. But we've got 
Condoleezza Rice back in the news. They say she's a possible vice presidential candidate for Romney, but either way, she loves this going hot with Syria. She wants us to back the rebels because, well, Russia's funding Assad. And while I'm sure that's true, we don't need to further strengthen the rebel force we've already backed. It's already been CIA train, uh, Mossad train, British MI6 train, all of it. We put them in there. It's very transparent, but let's go to that clip now of Condi calling basically for blood in the Middle East. Once again, she didn't do enough in her years presiding over the Iraq war. Let's make an uh, alliance with those who understand that Syria will never be stable with Bashar al-Assad in place. Let's help the opposition to organize, and uh, Syria will be better off with Bashar al-Assad, and so will the Middle East. You say help the opposition to organize. Um, do you support, like Senator McCain does, arming the rebels? Uh, yes, I do believe that you're probably ultimately going to have to We're arm the, the rebels. Opposition. It's a whole geostrategic game, and it's a perfect place to point out why the left and right really have no distinct difference in our currently occupied United States, because... They both want war in the Middle East. In many ways, Obama's regime has been more effective at toppling domino pieces without the larger fallout. The Iraq war is still going on. It was a big controversy, lots of protesters. The Libya thing was quick, real quick. The, the, uh, the Middle Eastern uprising, the Arab Spring, supposedly this democratic movement. But look what we have a year later. We have Egypt run by the Muslim Brotherhood. All those areas getting more and more radicalized, and the West just loves it. They want a clash of civilizations. That's what these neocons and these people in the Obama left at the CFR and everything, they're part of the same larger group. They all want a larger clash of civilizations. Just look into it. Huntington, I think, has the book. Anyway, the very Syrian rebels that Condoleezza Rice wants us to back are now ransacking Christian churches, just showing how extreme they are, how anti-West they really are, yet they're supposedly our allies. Shocking images have emerged which show the aftermath of Christian churches ransacked by NATO-backed Syrian rebels, illustrating once again how Western powers are supporting Muslim extremists in their bid to achieve regime change in the Middle East. And it's got this guy here in priest robes and them tearing apart churches, setting them on fire, and on and on. And again, we're supposed to be in a war on terror against these extremists, Al-Qaeda and the rest of them, and yet they're our allies and we're letting them ransack these churches in the Middle East just because it suits larger geopolitical strategy. And that's just some of the images. The rest are posted on Paul Joseph Watson's article at Infowars.com, but just shocking stuff that's going on in Syria. Meanwhile, you'd think after hiring pedophiles and enraging the public with their pat-down policies, the radiation scanners, and more, that the TSA would only go up from there. But Betty, uh, Becky Akers breaks down how that, of course, was not the bottom of the barrel. Outrage again as this week the TSA has opened and spilled the ashes of traveler John Grosh, who was transporting the remains of someone through the airport, but instead they opened it up and laughed as Gross tried to pick up the bone fragments from the floor. Now, once again, giving good reason to be outraged at the TSA's policies, but that's not enough because the patent liars, the repeated liars, the known liars have accused Gross's version of being inaccurate, saying they basically followed policies, that their policy was never to open up human remains, I guess just to scan them, and that's supposedly even against the law, but it didn't stop them from basically defending the guy who did open it up and then laugh at the person trying to pick up the human remains. Just disgusting. When are we going to learn the TSA does not have our constitutional interests at heart or even just basic humanity, nor can they keep us safe, nor have they ever caught a terrorist? You put the pieces together. We'll turn now to the daily quote. A nation that is afraid to let its people judge the truth and falsehood in an open market is a nation that is afraid of its people. That's yet, that's yet another quote from John F. Kennedy, of course, murdered by just one lone man. Anyway, we're going to turn now to Ask Alex, another segment from Planet InfoWars, which is your tool to fight the InfoWar your way. We urge you to go sign up, join that network, help it grow, help reach people in the ways you think are most effective. But meanwhile, we've got a lengthy segment where Christy helps bring the questions to Alex. Watch for yourself, but stay because after that, we're going to go to break and come back with Carl Herman of Washington's blog to discuss pensions and the CAFR elephant in the room. Thanks for watching. Hi, and welcome to the Ask Alex questions from the Ask Alex group on Planet InfoWars. I'm here with Alex Jones. 
and I'm Christy Hightower, so let's get started. Uh, and, and let me just stop yeah, you. Okay. I got to interrupt, <laughs> trademark Alex Jones. I've noticed people online, and I got to respond to trolls because it's fun, saying this is scripted in here. This oh. is not scripted. No. She came in here about two minutes ago, and I had time to look at the top here. We're doing the nightly news, 7 o'clock every night, the syndicated three-hour radio show every day, InfoWars Live, and wouldn't matter if I'd already heard these questions. Uh, but the implication is... We want you to be live. We well, want you to be... Well, exactly. But the implication is is that I couldn't talk on my feet. Right. Everybody knows it's the opposite. <laughs> I have diarrhea of the mouth here, ladies and gentlemen. So I, I don't know about these questions yet. Uh, I've looked at one of them. And to be honest, sometimes I'm not going to have all the full answers about these uh, because I haven't had time to... And that's the point. Exactly. It's an on-the-fly deal. Yeah. But most importantly, it's about PlanetInfoWars.com. You go there to ask me questions in the Ask Alex section. You go there to do your own journalism, uh, to claim that I uh, you know, work for blood-drinking lizards. Whatever <laughs> it is, you go to PlanetInfoWars.com. There's dating, camping, fishing, whatever the case is. Sorry, Christy. No, We've got fine. Gerald Salente okay. coming up in 15 minutes, so I better get rolling here. All right. We'll make this fast then. All right, so uh, this is from Steph. She says, uh, hey, Alex, some of my trendy but well-meaning friends keep sending me links to sign online petitions from uh, avaz.org. Uh, some of the petitions push for the U.N. to create a no-fly zone over Libya and to pressure the U.N. to support the FSA in Syria. Um, Azaz covers a myriad of issues and claims not to receive any funding from corporations or foundations. So, Alex... Uh, Avaz.org, uh, which claims to have 14 million members, a glo is it a globalist tool or just a group of misguided, well-meaning activists trying to do some good? Let me look it up here real quick because I've got to be honest. I don't want to sit here and uh, talk about somebody I don't know about. See, this is the problem with a question like this uh, is that sometimes, like I said last time on that video, if I don't know, then you guys can bring me the info and then I can come back in a part two. That'd be but, awesome. But what I do know is that there's lots of online petition sites where basically anybody can create a petition. Uh, Whitehouse.gov does this, and, and people are saying, oh my gosh, you know, the president wants to, wants to have GMO labeling. No, he doesn't. I can go to Whitehouse.gov and create a petition and then get people to sign it and send it to them. And they found this whole Delphi technique. They like to make you think that you're actually interfacing with them and that they're listening to you. So it's just a, a tool to make it look like the White House is transparent, listening to people, when when it comes to real meat and potatoes issues, totally run by the same globalist lobbyist. Now, I don't know about this particular site. My memory is I think I've seen it before, and I think that it does have a lot of members because I'm going from memory tentatively here, but look it up yourself, that basically anybody can go there and do a petition. So, of course, you're going to have NGOs from the U.N. going in to this site or other sites and creating them. Um, but the answer is go and create your own petitions because really, even if government ignores it to a certain extent, it's a way to get issues in front of people. In fact, I've found that we've gone out and done some comedy pieces showing so-called environmentalists wanting to ban dihydrogen monoxide. That's water. But, but, but we say, oh, dihydrogen monoxide, it's, it's uh, in the ground around here. Uh, it it, it, it uh, causes you to have to urinate uh, and uh, other issues. Would you like side effects. Would you like to ban dihydrogen monoxide? About 90 plus percent are like, yes, ban it right now. Also, wow. a sodium chloride. And, and that's, well, that's salt, table salt. They want to ban that. The point is, see, I said we have to hurry, but <laughs> Salente's great, but he can wait a few minutes. The point is, is that, uh, I'm just joking. Uh, the point is, is that I am very, is this is all scripted, ladies and gentlemen, right now. <laughs> as you can tell, it's a teleprompter. Don't show the teleprompter over there, Aaron. Now they're going to believe it, Aaron. Aim the camera over there so they can see it. <laughs> no, we have no teleprompter. Now, Lewis is, who's also one of the great I'm moderators over at planetinfowars.com. <laughs> he is hiding back there. Show Lewis, the guy that secretly gives all the orders around here. Yeah, yeah. There he is, I'll ladies and gentlemen. Orders from this guy right here. That is the secret <laughs> guy. <laughs> All right, now, now hold on. This is out of control now. This is out of control now. But but I have to go back to number one question. No, we only have two pages here. Yeah, no um, deal. <clears throat> no, actually, I think I've answered that question. The UN is very good. Oh, oh, to finish the other point, we would go out and get them to talk to us with a petition. So so people are ready to talk. It's just a great way to get people to politically talk to you. Of course, have a real petition, but it's a way to educate people. They'll stop 
for whatever reason, if, if they're told it's a, a political or social issue thing. Right. Other issue is the UN does a lot of this on well-meaning topics to make their overall agenda sound good, but at the core of it, it's a very murderous authoritarian system that basically hides a neocolonialism. And so that's what the UN does. Moving right along to question number two, Christy. Moving right along. All right, so the Indiana state legislator recently voted to allow the people to shoot and kill any rogue cop who inv illegally invades your home. Uh, this is well within the Constitution and Federalist Papers and complies with the Castle laws and rulings, but so far you've been mum on the subject. Um, this is per Helgon user. So they, they are they cover. are... They are somebody who really pays attention. I've had that article two or three times in the last week <laughs> since it passed in Indiana and meant to cover it, but so many days Michael I don't Hunt. get to it all. Look, I can't get to one question here. <laughs> um, but, but the way I'm describing this is basically how I'm you know, thinking about it. I have meant to cover it. It's just a big subject, and I meant to pull out some of the rulings that this person alludes to and never got around to it, so then I never covered it because I didn't want to not have the rulings, and there's literally hundreds of them. But here's the truth behind the story. You know, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, Texas tried to pass a law last year saying the TSA couldn't grope people at the airport because it's illegal. Well, right. it's it's already on the books as illegal. That's why a cop can't randomly stop you and stick their hand down your or pants. The CIA or, the or, CIA. Or, or, or the CIA or the CIA or FBI or anybody. Exactly, Christy. So... Why do we need a law to enforce something that's already the law? And so that's true about Indiana, is that a police officer that breaks into your house as a rogue, and that happens quite often, some of them go crazy or they were criminals to begin with, uh, police officers commonly, and one of the problems is you know, try to force women into uh, 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 different relations or police uh, tend to rob motorists. That's uh, something that's extremely common. It's not all police, but they're, especially in some of these big cities where, where criminals get in, the union's criminal controlled, and you get a force of criminals, there's big problems with police beating people up, raping them, killing them, robbing them. And grand juries were so brainwashed that they didn't know about common law or rulings or existing laws. They would still convict someone who shot a police officer that broke in their house without a warrant and was, and was beating them. And so the state legislature passed a law, which is a good law, reaffirming that. But the media spun it like people now are going to say a police officer is unlawful and shot them. Well, here's the deal. Police didn't even get set up in this country until about 150 years ago in New York City. And the big joke is the, the film The Gangs of New York, Martin Scorsese, is very accurate. They were the first big, mean, vicious street gang. That's why the New York police are still so corrupt today. There are a lot of better forces around the country. You could debate whether you want a police force or not. But the issue is, is that the system, the nanny state wants people totally and completely, absolutely dependent on government. So they don't want the idea of us being able to defend ourselves, much less defend ourselves against uh, rogue police. People with badges. People with badges that are out of control. But the other point I was going to make, uh, which is the key, I forgot. But, but here's the issue. Um, police were set up as part uh, under the state charter of the county and then the city, the city citizens organized themselves in a corporation, just like the Mayflower came over as a corporation right. or you know, Jonestown or whatever, or Jamestown. They all came over and set up a corporation. So that's where that idea comes from. So a city is a corporation under the state laws. And then we go and say, we're going to specially train people to be police officers who work for us. And here are our city laws that follow the state laws that follow the Constitution. Right. Okay. And so all yeah. a cop. Ideally. Exactly. So all a cop is. Well, yeah, that's how it's supposed to work. Right. <laughs> so all a cop is, is someone who has been duly sworn, bonded, and trained to engage in professional citizens arrest. Just like I can go out of somebody's mugging uh, an old lady or robbing you know, somebody, I can go up and, and, and physically restrain them, and if they try violence, I can kill them. That's a citizen's arrest power. If I catch somebody breaking into my garage and I pull out my 357 and I say, hands up or I'm going to kill you, that's a citizen's arrest right there. Okay, So cops only have citizen's arrest. It's now become butt backwards ass backwards as they call it, uh, where, where they're trying to say citizens can't defend ourselves 
and only the police can do it because the government wants a monopoly of power. So there is your uh, part two uh, on Indiana. I'm glad I've now had a chance to cover it. Folks can look up the rulings. He mentions uh, one of them there, but there are literally, no doubt, thousands. I've seen hundreds as I follow this closely that if, that if some cop off to your on duty goes crazy and wants to bust down your door and come into your house without a warrant, it's just like any other criminal. Right. And you have a right and a duty to defend yourself, but... We've been taught we'll get in trouble if we try to defend ourselves, you know? Like, you, you, somebody breaks into your home and you hurt them because they've broken into your home, they sue you. I mean, yeah, and they've tried to have courts have bad rulings. Like, like England's got to the point where, they, where you go to jail if you defend yourself. It hasn't gotten like that here yet because we're pushing back. Nice. Alex, there's this viral video. It's, uh, it's on YouTube, and it's actually titled Detained for Open Carry. Portland, Maine. There is a reason to stop you. Unless you suspect me of a crime, as Terry v. Ohio, Delaware v. Uh, Prouse uh, requires you to have a suspicion of crime before you detain an individual. Brown v. Texas you're, you're, does, no, does not allow you to stop an individual and demand their ID. Um, so the, the user is trying to tell you we're awake here in Maine, so yay. And um, he goes, perhaps now that people are starting to come together, uh, what direction is the freedom and truth movement going, especially with the direct hit on the Paul campaign? Um, or is, is Ron even still in the race? This is a uh, bad robot army is the user. Well, that's a long question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we thought Indiana was long. I have not seen that particular video, but I've seen countless videos over the last decade where people exercise their right to open carry. There's laws against concealed carry because in ancient times, a criminal would conceal weapons but free people would wear their swords or muskets openly. Make it well known. And that's why you wave at somebody. That's a sign of, hey, no weapon in my hand. I'm a friend. Uh, uh, that's why you shake somebody's hand. Uh, because it's, it's really an oath that you're friendly. You wouldn't shake the hand of somebody you didn't like. People are all into like being honorable up front. Because uh, no one would associate with anybody who is deceptive or a liar or uh, you know, disreputable. And so almost all 50 states have the common law and then laws in their state constitutions where open carry is legal concealed carry is illegal that's how they trick you into getting a concealed carry going oh go go get a license for a concealed carry it creates the perception that all carrying is illegal uh, plus they have most of these dramas and sh cop shows set in new york mm -hmm. where they pull you over and oh you got a gun you're going to jail one of the few cities where it's actually illegal right. because it's got unto unconstitutional garbage uh, on the books that hasn't been overthrown actually it has been overthrown but they keep doing it in Chicago and New York, there's actually been rulings. Uh, Supreme Court's ruled repeatedly, actually, the last few years properly that it's an absolute individual right. So the point is, is that um, this is one of the greatest civil rights or human rights movements out there, is that people go out and wear guns and go to rallies. We were at Bilderberg and people had side holstered guns and they weren't provocateurs. Uh, and it really, you know, sent the message across that, hey, you got guns? you know, hired police that are here guarding the criminal Bilderbergs. We got guns too. We're free people. We're on par with you. And by the way, it isn't just our right. It's your right too, officers. That's how you can carry a gun right. because you're designated as a citizen arrest, specially trained person, as we just talked about. But this is one of the biggest issues where you demonstrate a right, you exercise the right publicly, and then the illusion that guns are illegal and guns are bad dissipates that Hollywood's put out. And, and this is the equivalent of holy water to a vampire or a giant crucifix right in Count Dracula's face. Uh, and so hundreds of people that I've seen on YouTube videos, I haven't seen this one, have been arrested. But in the last few years, the cops have had memos. They've been, it's been explained to them, hey, you can't do this. People have been shot in stores who were legally carrying. I've, I've seen one of those videos. So it is dangerous, but not as dangerous as it was a few years ago. A few years ago, it didn't matter if it was Vermont or Arizona where total gun culture, even more than Texas, they would still harass you, detain you, arrest you. Uh, but now because of people hitting the barbed wire like that and politically standing up for all of us, now people are like, you can have a gun openly. I got to tell you, the first people I've seen do this in the last decade, it was the new Black Panther Party. And even though I didn't agree with what uh, the leader of it said, a quite racist fellow, he marched in uh, Houston with a bunch of his guys with 12 gauges. In fact, you might be able to find the file footage of that. And all over Texas, people are like, you can have guns open. You can have them out in the open. Making it known. Well, well, absolutely. Listen, we've gotten to the point where when I was a teenager, we still had rifles 
uh, in our pickup trucks. And it was, I mean, even in Dallas, people had rifles in their pickup trucks. But it got to the point where the cops would pull you over and harass you. Right. Now the, the, now those rifles are coming back. People are like, okay, go ahead and harass me. And then I'm going to file complaints on you. Go ahead and arrest me. You're going to get a civil rights lawsuit and lose. We're winning. This is an area where it shows when we take action, we have nothing but victory after victory. Okay, now I've done the first three or four long-winded here. I'm going to try to give 60-second answers to each additional one. Good luck. These okay. are great questions, though. I mean, that, I mean, that's why. They're just amazing. Uh, all right. Well, he. Uh, there is one last thing, though. It, it, how does that play into the direction for the freedom movement? I mean, well, I mean, he's talking about, part of, uh, part of it. you know, Ron Paul taking a hit. Ron Paul didn't win. Ron Paul's trying to get more delegates to have a say at the Republican convention. Uh, Rand's plan politics, which I understand. I don't really agree with it. Working with Romney. Uh, and that just shows the people are exercising our rights. If you don't exercise them, you lose them. I mean, it's 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 yeah. a big victory. Yeah, this one comes to you from Bob. He says, don't you ever get overwhelmed by all the information you need to deliver? So obviously you said yourself, the Indiana legislation, uh, you haven't gotten to touch on. Um, I what was happening right before you came in here? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and tell chaos, us. Chaos, um, I mean, I had like 10 people trying to talk to me. And, uh, one minute, one minute. And, and yeah, all of this was insane. I mean, it was just... Yeah, well, Bob suggests, he says, uh, I think you should use your existing equipment uh, to have like three shows daily, say the Aaron Dyke show, the Paul Watson show, et cetera. Um, believe it or not, the, the news and the truth, there are addicts out there who want to hear it. So um, that's just his contribution. What we're doing is we have Paul Watson, we have Aaron Dykes, we have Darren McBrain and fruit flies that infest the office because we don't throw away the garbage. Anyways... Um, <laughs> This thing's living here year round. Yeah, hey, that's on the DL me. there, Al. Uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, that's why we started the nightly news, is so we can build more shows around that down the road. That's why gotcha. I do it two or three nights a week. Or even though I'm not hosting the show Wednesday night, you know, it's Tuesday, we're taping this, I'll be on the show with this. Right. Uh, so we're getting it to the point where we won't just have five nights a week, seven o'clock, a news show. We're going to have other shows. Awesome. Uh, I have a tendency to bite off more than I can chew, like starting that gun show, which I do still plan to do with the Steiners, just that it's overwhelming. Right. I'm, I'm, I launched the social network finally. I'm planning to launch a monthly newspaper. But, folks, finally Aaron's gonna, he's been working for three, four <laughs> days. He's behind the camera right now on a big piece we're putting out on the nature of reality. I mean, we cannot do more shows at this point. We're working on it, though. We had to do a hiatus last week from the nightly news right. because of this. For that reporter contest. And then she's hounding me to do these question and answers. <laughs> Come on, Alex, let's get to it. Um, all right, so this this guy, this is actually bringing in a Planet InfoWars user in terms of um, his article that he published. He says, I just posted an article on Planet InfoWars about the Louisiana owners of property that are trying to be taken by the government for an endangered frog yes. that may or may not be living there. Um, what should you do about this type of con government control spreading Agenda 21 uh, wherever they want? Well, the fraudsters at the UN admit, because their emails got leaked and other issues, that their fraud of global warming is over. They're still keeping the carbon taxes, but everybody knows it's a fraud. And they are abandoning that. Oh, I just exhaled. How much do I owe you? A lot. <laughs> well, plants are going to breathe that. And so now what's happening is they're shifting back to the ice caps have melted, which, by the way, they're getting bigger. But they know the public doesn't look at that. You got to pay us more money or the polar bears are going to die. And here in Austin, they took over the years more than 50,000 acres from farmers outside town back in the mid 90s. 15,000 acres here, a couple thousand there. It was over 50,000 total. They would not let them build on it. They'd do eminent domain, take it, pay them pennies on the dollar, not for the development rights, but for less than what they bought it for previously, decades before in some cases. In some cases, it was ranches that have been the family over 100 years. I went and interviewed some of them. And then they would turn around, and then the environmental groups that control the city, they're not really environmental groups, they're mafias, would take the restrictions off. Oh, the cave bug isn't endangered. Oh, the warbler isn't endangered. Oh, the salamander isn't endangered in this area now. Oh, and, and this bank set up by the former mayor, it's going to broker it all now. And they build malls, shopping centers, luxury homes, golf courses. Mm -hmm. And they're just building on all of it, uh, almost all of it. It's totally sick. Uh, it's totally evil, and yeah, I have seen, it's, it's all over the country, cave bugs, frogs, salamanders, they've caught the federal government planting uh, birds that aren't even endangered, period, worldwide, but just in one region, mm -hmm. and they'll go plant them there. 
so they can then come in and selectively, and it's always the big developers that are behind it. They're, they're the ones, and, and, and Goldman Sachs funding. We go to these smart growth conferences all the time, and when you get there, it is the banksters. It is the Goldman Sachs people. We've done newscasts on it, uh, where they're the ones running the whole event. And with the people in the crowd, sent there from the cities and counties and, and, and realtors, they know it's a fraud too, most of them. I mean, they're there as criminals, uh, as operatives within the system to just take property. And they know it. I mean, I, I went to a smart growth conference back in the late 90s. And I was like, you're taking land. This is a scam. And, and when my camera's off, they'd go, you better effing believe it is, punk. We're taking over. I mean, th these are just criminals. They know full well what they're doing. Not like they're like little loving liberal idiots or something. But they send out teenagers to your door and college students to say, can you give me $20 for this group or that group? It's for the earth. And, and you know, you go, oh, give them, oh, it's for the earth. They use that to fund their operation to politically take over your city. Then they rob you once they get in control. Sounds like another documentary in the works. Um. <laughs> More work. <laughs> You're welcome, Alex. It never starts. And then I'm burnt out like this, <laughs> babbling like a chimpanzee. <laughs> okay, this one is, is actually one of my favorite uh, questions. Uh, it says communication. It's always been the most important thing in any war, the ability to communicate. Uh, now that we are almost all on the digital equipment, cell phones, um, IP phones, digital, whatever, um, very few people have landlines. And uh, what are the consequences and perhaps solutions to linking patriots better in the event of a purposeful system shutdown. I mean, we all know about the, the electromagnetic shocks that could essentially wipe out computers and your car. I mean, things like that. So it's a great question from Colin. Are you it Colin? is a great question. Uh, I just doodle when I'm okay. thinking. <laughs> if I don't doodle, I'll interrupt you. Oh, okay, good. I'm glad that you did. <laughs> I'm glad you did that. It's like a spruce tree. And there's like a lake in the distance. We'll say abstract. Absolutely. Uh, and some snow capped mountains okay back to the question anyways the uh <laughs> communication what what to do i mean if if everything in here electricity was no longer an option i mean what what would you do it's good to have things like cbs and things but the police are now going under a unified federalized system so that everything is basically scrambled and we can't listen to it ham radio is good if people get into that to be able to communicate uh, if the globalists shut down the internet or start curtailing it uh, it's also important to have your own old-fashioned printing presses. That's what we've done with the Obama uh, dictator contest and joker contest to show the power of just going out and hanging up good old-fashioned you know, papers right. uh, in public commons and areas. Um, but to, to try to get the general public back into some type of analog or radio system yeah. is not really feasible. It's better to try to educate people now before something like this takes place so the globalists don't feel confident enough to go to that. Instead of digging in, we should go and take over or take the country back or expose the enemy to such an extent that they can't competently go to this dark system, this, this, uh, this, this Berlin Wall of control. Uh, now, it is good, like I said, to have ham radio if you know how to use it. People want to get into that. Got to have a call sign, though. Uh, call sign, sure. To get a, sure. Uh, you can have to get a license. They say you do, but, you know, whatever. They're a bunch of criminals. Uh, that's going on. Um, you know, like I said, long-range, short-range CBs, things like that. But really, it's best just to get to know people in your area yeah. uh, and uh, have a backup in case things do collapse. I'd say 80% fight the New World Order. Try to defeat them ahead of time. Best defense is a good offense. 20% dig in as a backup. Storable food, firearms, gold, silver, uh, uh, communications. But just to buy a bunch of communications, yeah, I got a big ham radio out there. I'm going to talk to people. You better get on it now. I mean, we're kind of behind the learning curve here for most people. So make friends, Colin. You heard that? <laughs> get out. <laughs> um, why are you putting the promotion of uh, the cost effective? This is this is coming to you from uh, Pythagoras. Um, why are you putting the promotion of the cost effective AE 911 truth on the back burner and championing the expensive, inefficient software Ron Paul campaign? This is his words, not mine. Um, if uh, AE 911 Truth doesn't become a household name, does not doesn't start to wake people up, nothing we do can. Um, I think that they're trying to get at the fact that. No, I know what they're talking about. Okay. Look, I'm the guy that started the 911 Truth movement. Right. I'm the guy that said it six months before, two months before. Uh, the, the person that said they'll blow up the World Trade Centers and blame it on Bin Laden, you know, July 25th of 2001. I'm the guy that 
has had Richard Gage on probably 30 times and who's had all these other people on. I, I got Jesse Ventura to go public on my show, Willie Nelson. And there is a hardcore group around architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. I sell their videos. I have them on who call and email and are just constantly, get them on, get them on, you've done nothing. And I think that has the opposite effect mm -hmm. where, well, number one, 9-11 Truth is not just architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Right. Uh, they're great people. Uh, but people are trying to tell, you, you, you know, the, uh, the, the preacher how to sing in the choir. So, uh, I mean, I get these questions constantly. You go set up an architects and engineers for truth thing on the website. Uh, you go cover it. You go get into it. I mean, I talk about 9-11 Truth almost every day on the radio. I've made four films on it. Uh, I put Luke Radowski and his great activism on the map and got support for him up front. And it's not a pet peeve. It's just, it's an irritant when people say, why have you put this on the back burner? Instead, you're promoting Ron Paul. Ron Paul is about getting the general public awake to the new world order. And... I'm not just promoting Ron Paul. I promote Ron Paul maybe a couple times a week. Uh, so again, if you look at my radio show today, it was Billy Corrigan talking about the New World Order, uh, Smashing Pumpkins. That reaches all his fans and people. I had Jesse Ventura back on. I had TSA whistleblowers on uh, exposing that. I, I'm always facing the, the next phase. People say, well, did you thumbprint to get a driver's license? Yes, I got arrested 14 years ago protesting it. I was unable to stop that, so I went ahead and got the driver's license and did it. It's not about me getting out of thumbprinting myself. It's about exposing the biometrics in the cashless society, you see. And so I've done the 9-11 truth. I still cover it. I, I get into it uh, constantly. Can't live in the past, though. I mean, you have to keep moving forward. There's other things that face us. We're dealing with other yeah. false flags, like them trying to get planes shot down over Syria right now. Right. Or, or a new Oklahoma City to be blamed on domestic groups or how they're using Al-Qaeda against these other countries. I know Salente is on and ready to go. Uh, well, do you want to wrap this up? We can we'll just real fast, give me the last ones here. Uh, okay, um, Alex, what do you think about the fact that all but one of our presidents are related to the royal family and the Queen of England? Also, do you believe the royal family and the Sinclairs are the leaders of the New World Order? This is from Austin. I don't know about the Sinclairs, uh, but certainly the sachs coburg Gothas. That's the, that's the Transylvanian family that became German royalty and then became British royalty uh, that run it. They pretty much are German and French because they intermarried so much. But the point is, they're very close to the top of the pyramid. I mean, their wealth is secret. And then they have all these TV productions about how they have nothing and live off welfare. It's all a front. The ultra elites like the Rothschilds and the Queen, they always act like they have no power. That's their PR. That's their cover story. Um, and there's been reports where the Rothschilds have sued people who say they're the puppet masters that really own all these oligarchs. And then it came out in court, they did. Uh, so that's going on. And that's basically my answer to that. Uh, okay. Um, Hillary being a felon fined 300K for violation of the Logan Act. Um, if Obama appointed her as Secretary of State, if that's criminal, I think it's enough to impeach and uh, undo some of his laws. What's your opinion now? They just don't enforce the Logan Act anymore. And uh, that, that, you know, that fine was in the mid-90s. So, um, But certainly we should impeach Obama. We should impeach any tyrant and, and reverse what they've done. And we're getting close with Fast and Furious. Yeah. What's the last one? Uh, well, actually, this is uh, not from the group, but it was interesting enough for me to want to bring it up. There's a penny that someone sent in with a mason symbol. Hammered into it. Hammered into it. And uh, the guy that sent it in said he just wants you to... Tell them about it, if you know anything about why uh, it would be on a penny or you know, any sort of... I don't know anything about it. Okay. I'm sure he could go online and find out why why the Masons would hammer the symbol uh, of Masons into a penny. But I personally have no idea. Perhaps you can look into that. And like I said, next time... We can do a recap. We can do a recap. Yep. Christy, great job. PlanetInfoWars.com. And you're watching InfoWars Nightly News. We taped this Tuesday. You're watching it on Wednesday. And uh, Aaron, who's behind the camera right now, is hosting the news this evening. So let's come back to Aaron Dykes and InfoWars Nightly News. Thanks again for tuning in, y'all. Uh, send all your questions to the Ask Alex group on Planet InfoWars. Till next time. Aaron Dykes.
Have you been to InfoWarsShop.com lately? Express your inner patriot with these brand new InfoWars t-shirts. Say it loud with the InfoWars bullhorn shirt. Or educate the sheeple with the Bill of Rights shirt. Grope the public's mind with the TSA shirt. And with this shirt, you can let the dark side know of the Rebel Alliance's power. All available at InfoWarsShop.com sick of the globalist eugenicist control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die start purifying your water with pro pure my friends i've done a lot of research and the best gravity filter out there bar none is pro pure and it's available discounted at infowars.com its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth there's no priming required it's nsf 42 certified optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95 percent easy to set up and use does doesn't require electricity. Purify water from lakes, streams, ponds, and wells. This filter system leaves in beneficial minerals, which is key. Save money by not buying bottled water and avoid BPA that leaches from the plastic. ProPure is the best gravity-fed filter out there. It's what my family uses. Infowars.com already has the lowest price on ProPure. But if you add the promo code WATER at checkout, you get an additional 10% off at Infowars.com. You can also call to order 888-253-3139. We are back at the InfoWars Nightly News, and of course we turn now to the ongoing economic crisis as they preach the age of austerity, as they continue to say that countries in Europe need bailouts. What's coming to the home front? Well, we decided to talk to Carl Herman. He's a contributor at Washington's blog. He's also a longtime board certified teacher in a number of subjects and is working in lobbying and research for, quote, a better future. And we're going to discuss the big elephant in the room issue that is CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Reports and the hidden budgets that go with this. Carl, thanks for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Now, this is a complex issue. Uh, it's hard for people to understand. Let's start with the basics of what is CAFR, what are these larger budget crises we're facing, why are they having shortfalls in pensions, and let's go from there. Yeah, I'd like to begin by reframing this that is actually very simple to understand. When you hear about a budget deficit, they're telling the truth, and it's a lie of omission. That is similar to a household saying, accurately reporting what's in the checking account. Now, in our households, if there's a shortage in checking, you immediately ask the question, what do we have in savings? Right. That is what the CAFR reveals. And what I decided to do is actually Clint Richardson did a great job with the California CAFR, and he laid out for 2011 that California has $577 billion in cash and investments. And then I went ahead and did a little bit of work in that. That means that when Governor Brown says that the budget deficit crisis of $16 billion uh, demands austerity, that's a lie because we have options. I'm just going to round up because we have $600 billion in cash and investments in our savings account. I mean, that's totally crazy. Can you break down what is the CFR and why is that off, off the books? Why is that in its you know, the savings component instead of the checking component, as we're saying here? Well, the why question as an academic, I don't go there. Uh, I think that the real power is to be able to point out that it is there and we have options and that it is a, just as if um, you were in charge of our household and you said we have to have austerity, if we broke, broke this down and, and compared it to a household, Aaron, and we had a problem of $16,000 of a shortage in our checkbook account, and we had 600,000 in savings and cash and investments, we'd be fine. We'd just go ahead and transfer some from savings into checking and, and we'd be good. So the real power is to point out that it's there and then the, to demand that the public know about it. Well, exactly. So how much are we facing in shortfall, just in California as an example, in the pensions, in the ordinary budget, and the rest of it? Okay, now when you press government officials and you say, well, what about this money? There are three typical lies that they tell. One is that they'll say that these are designated accounts. All right, 
the lawmakers are the people who do the designating, and at the very least, they can go ahead and comprehensively advise the voters for options to redesignate those funds. So the designation doesn't make any sense. The second lie, which you point to, is that we're told that they're pension funds. All right. Now, that's a really great admission, and we can work with that, because if you jump into the California CAFR, and all people need to do is they can take a look at my work, and I have the link to the CAFR and the page numbers right there. The pension plan for California last year for the public employees cost $27 billion, okay? The $460 billion of investments that we're told is funding those pensions you can look at the CAFR and see how much income is generated. Now, this is huge. When media report on this, they get all excited because the stock value of that pension investment fund goes up, and they report as if that's a good thing. But what we really want to take a look at is how much income is generated from those investments. So California has a total of $600 billion. Only $1 billion of the $27 billion pension cost is paid by the income of the investment fund. Now, how do we know that? You take a look at the CAFR and it says, uh, okay, income from investments, $10 billion. But then right below that is $3 billion in expenses. All right, so we got seven left. But if you take a look at the investments, you find that California chooses to purchase government debt securities and we get income from that. Okay, fine. If we're gonna do that, then we have to take into account that, that California chooses to sell our own debt. That has an interest cost of $6 billion. So the investments made 10, we paid our Wall Street investors three, and then we gotta subtract six for the interest that we're paying on our own debt. Mm -hmm. So the net income toward this $27 billion pension cost is only one. Now, what I'm hammering on, and I'm working with my two California state legislators who are doing the best they can so far to dance around this issue and, and uh, not have to make a public statement, is that the so-called pension fund only funds 4% of the cost of California pensions. It's totally insane, but if it was a straight investment of that 600 billion or the 400 left over, you could practically make that in an ordinary bank on an ordinary return enough to pay for the pensions. Exactly. And I did that, you know, that got me curious. And I took a look at the, uh, the returns, the income returns for the last four years, Aaron, it's been negative on average in California. So we're holding on. So the taxpayers forfeit this 600 billion, which uh, is over 50,000 per household. So the, really the impact of this for Californians is to understand that we have assets that the government is hanging on to that we don't have access to that's valued at 50,000 per household. I look back over the last 10 years at the CAFR data, the average rate of, of uh, income generated from that withheld taxpayer assets is just 1%. So the idea that it's funding pensions is just refuted absolutely by the data. And yet it is supposed to fund pensions, right? Well, that's what we're told. And that's what the accounts are designated for. So now we're using this nonpartisan economic data to raise a question of, is it possible that we could use these tremendous colossal assets more effectively to fund our public goods and services. And that's all that, by the way, my assembly member, Anthony Portentino and state Senator Carol Liu, uh, they've been sitting on this data for three weeks. I contact them um, a couple times a week at least. All I want for them to say is yes, these numbers are accurate. Yes, we could have professional and the uh, cost benefit analyses and the public take a look at these numbers and we could consider a redesignation of our current structure that isn't funding pensions and isn't touching the $16 billion budget deficit. 
Well, that's why I wanted you on today, because I know our audience knows a good bit in general about Kaffir. Alex made a film about it many years ago. We've had experts like Walter Burian on, but we need to make it an issue here and now so we don't have to go into a European-style debt crisis, where obviously they're facing austerity over issues, including pension and their whole social security systems and on and on. Is California the worst state in the U.S. facing these issues? Because I know there's shortfalls in Texas, uh, New York, the other big states, Illinois. Uh, what do you see on the national front for the pension issue? I'm not looking. Yeah. Uh, but I can tell you is that it isn't a shortfall and that part of the power of political reframing is to understand that this $16 billion budget deficit, we have 35 times that amount in cash and in savings. And if that message became clear, then we would force the reconsideration of these tremendous assets. But let me go further into this. Um, the state of California has a CAFR, true. But there are about 14,000 various government entities in the state of California, Aaron. For example, LA County in their CAFR, they have 60, I think it's 66 billion dollars in cash and investments. Walter Burian, who's a hero and the pioneer of this issue, as you know, he did a data sampling for California's various um, governmental agencies. He estimates that the total for California is about eight trillion dollars. That means that per household in California, there are 12 million households, we've been overtaxed, or more accurately, we have taxpayer assets over $650,000 per household. So what that does is that blows this so-called shortage and, and any need for austerity, that completely is a game changer. It's totally insane because they've got their whole black budget issue and the public is never informed about it. And as you point out in your article, they don't remind the public. It is on the books, but you have to sort of hear about it and then look it up to even know what a CAFR is. Yeah, and every state can go ahead and, and people can do this. I explored this as a hobby journalist and I decided to check out three things. One is to contact my two state reps and I'm pushing them. Uh, the other is local media. My local newspapers have been very, very interested about this because they just didn't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And the other areas I checked was law enforcement, and that has been a tangled web. But the word that I got from the L.A. County District Attorney's Office is that um, he said that it's not a crime to not disclose this cash. And, of course, I followed it up. Please cite the law. And then please give an explanation of how all public statements saying that we have to go to austerity, how that isn't fraud, an intentional misrepresentation from somebody who has fiduciary responsibility for comprehensive, accurate financial information. It's mind-blowing to me because on the one hand, you've got the reserve cash. It could be redirected, as you discuss, to deal with the pension issue, which obviously people in the public sector have been paying into for decades. And then at the same time, the trend I'm seeing is all these large pension funds. I know a lot about the Texas teachers' retirement system because I've been studying it the past few weeks. They're getting riskier with their investments to deal with the shortfalls. They're putting more on Wall Street, and they're dealing more with these leveraged buyout firms. So that money that's supposed to be there for teachers is more and more evaporated into kind of this fictional money scenario that's going on globally. Yeah, I think you're giving them too much credit that they care about the teachers. This is just a cover story. If they really did care about funding these uh, programs and the public good, they would disclose it. And economics really has good tools to be able to provide options for the taxpayers, and it's, it's our assets. Uh, I think it might be helpful to take a look at there are three broad areas of reform that the people, my colleagues, my friends, we point to. Shall we talk about that? Let's do it. All right. So one is monetary reform. We don't have money. We have it to Orwellian opposite. It's a debt. What we use for money is created by private banks and the Fed as a debt that we have to repay with interest. As you may know, Dennis Kucinich sponsored legislation from the American Monetary Institute and Steven Zarlenga, who is another pioneer and a hero in monetary reform, that if we just created money debt-free, 
for the direct payment of public goods and services, then we have three amazing outcomes. One, the government can come, become employer of last resort and we would have full employment. Two, we would have optimal infrastructure because we could invest in hard and soft infrastructure with this labor paid directly with money that we create for it. And three, what people don't understand is that infrastructure contributes more to economic productivity than the cost of its inputs. So we get the full employment, we get the best infrastructure we can imagine, and we get overall falling prices. That is what monetary reform can do, and that's one area of reform. Right. You'll, you'll so to good. do that, though, we have to take on the whole Federal Reserve system. Yeah. That's a big Absolutely. one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I think we'd all like to see that done. How do we deal with the Fed system? How do we make that a big enough political issue to get the public uh, ground swelling behind it so that they can't ignore it anymore? Because obviously it has become an issue in Washington, but probably not a big enough public issue yet. Yeah, that's really the question, isn't it, Aaron? Yeah. And that's really what I see in the broad picture of what Occupy is attempting to do is for the 99% to have a critical mass recognize that in these huge areas, we're not being served, that really it's the 1% interests that are being served. And uh, we just got to keep pointing to the facts. I think we're close, but until we're there, it's just another day at the activist office. Right, right. So, uh, I, yeah, obviously that was point one of your monetary reforms. What are the other two points, briefly? The other part is credit reform. Ellen Brown is the leader with this, and this goes into the topic of state-owned banks. Now, if, when you go into the smaller government agencies, Aaron, and, you, and they'll tell you, yeah, we have a cash reserve, and yeah, we need it, because it, this is like any household. If some crisis happens, you need access to cash to pay your bills. All right. If you had a state-owned bank, you could have at-cost credit for government agencies, and they wouldn't have to retain these taxpayer surpluses. As you may know, uh, the state of North Dakota is the only state with an increasing budget surplus. And part of how they do that is that they have at cost credit. A big bet, the easiest way for me to say the benefits of this public credit, if the state had uh, its own bank, it could issue 2% mortgages, 2% credit cards, and that would give an abundance of paying for all of your state tax costs. All right, so bottom line, we know CFR is sort of the elephant in the room. We know, uh, as you say, it could be redirected to cover at least a lot of this, if not all of this, uh, budgetary shortfall problems and, and the unfulfilled pensions and so forth. How much of it is a criminal issue of people deliberately scheming the system and not reporting? How much of it is simply taxpayers not being aware of the CFR as a mechanism? Well, that goes into the whole broader picture of what we're attempting to do, what you're heroically attempting to do with this show, is that uh, it's a mind, it's a war for our minds. And uh, we're just pointing to the facts and uh, that if we could just engage with these facts, then we could really work together to build this brighter future that we all want. While these facts are hidden, the 1%, they'll lie to us. They'll engage in more wars, economic and physical wars and they'll continue to go down the path that we see, which is uh, debt slavery. So as you mentioned, California alone has 14,000, I think, different government entities. I don't know if they all have their own CFRs, but many of them do. So when we go state by state and people try to look up what their own states are involved in and, and how much CAFR could solve those issues, where do you look? It's hundreds of pages in each document. What's the bottom line uh, people need to look for? How do we interpret these documents meaningfully? Uh, I would recommend just look up my articles. And then if you take a look at California, I began doing this in 2009. And I looked at the state of California, the county of Los Angeles, and the city of Los Angeles. And I guess it took me about an hour for each one. And then the biggest numbers jump out at you. The investment portfolio is where the big numbers are. Now, in California, that's $460 billion, and then there's over $100 billion, but they're spread out through about 80 different accounts. So just taking a look at the investments that are designated for so-called for pensions, but we already went over that, right. and uh, 
people can find those big numbers in that way. But definitely this is an issue with other states besides California. It's just sort of the worst off at this point. Is that what you found? Well, I haven't checked other states. Walter Burian says, and he's probably familiar with most states' status with this, is that this is just business as usual. If you take a look at what we know of the Federal Reserve and the unlawful U.S. wars of aggression as the macrocosm of the United States, each state is still run by those same two political parties, okay? Right. So they have their own game within the state, and part of that is this overtaxation and these pension. Uh, it's really a scam because then it goes into these portfolios, which really goes into the rigged casino of, uh, of Wall Street. And then part of the most insidious part of it is that, all right, so the state of California, we own $92 billion of debt securities while we're in debt, $164 billion. That's not an investment, pal. That's, an, that's a transfer of interest from one set of taxpayers to another, but minus the cost of the debt managers taking their cut. So if this was any household, we would just divest a little bit and then our budget crisis would be solved just like that. But obviously they have counterparties who are interested in managing those investments and, that, and that's part of the whole deal going back to the party system and the way we're tied to Wall Street. Let me just bring that up since you mentioned it so people out there know. Britt Harris is the head of the Texas Teachers Retirement System. He went to Bilderberg 2012 this year. That's how he popped up on my radar. Let's get that uh, full screen if we can. And they've been literally, there it is, him talking about new investment risk. They got KKR and Apollo, two of the biggest leverage buyout firms to manage billions and billions of this uh, scheme they've got. And they asked the question here in this article, is the teacher's retirement system in the business of managing pensions or of running a hedge fund? And more and more, it's trending towards the hedge fund answer, which is just totally crazy because they're doing literally investing in casinos and losing money, uh, investing on the derivatives market and everything else that's been part of the problem with the larger economic crisis, not in any way part of the solution, at least as far as I could figure. Yeah, and I haven't found one article that talks about the income generated by those funds for the pension. And uh, that hopefully will be a bit of data that will help in uh, other people's interested analyses of their, of their state CAFR data. Well, Carl Herman, thanks for bringing this up. Let people know the best place to find your work. Would that be Washington's blog spot or do you have your own site? I do. I write for examiner.com. I write for Daily Censored, which is the daily version of Project Censored. But I recommend people go to Washington's blog. The, uh, the author who generated that site is brilliant. Yeah, it's a great place to learn, too. In conclusion, what's your best statement to the people out there? How do we make this an issue? Uh, is state by state the way to go? I don't know, man. I think that everybody has, to, <laughs> everybody has to look for their own self-expression, and if this is an area of interest, um, I thought the state was the best way to go to take a look at the biggest numbers that, that belong to, uh, to us in the state. Well, I bring that up, of course, because the case you made with California or you and Walter Burian's data is just mind boggling. It's just an astounding example of how this whole thing is almost designed to go wrong. Oh, it absolutely is. Hmm. All right, Carl Herman, thanks for joining us, and we'll speak to you in the future. That's well, it for tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. We'll be back again tomorrow. Keep watching, and don't forget about Prison Planet TV, where you can fund our nightly broadcasts and help us grow and reach more people.